Have you ever heard of an intriguing team in the NFL, folks? Well, my guest today, he knows a little bit about Philadelphia, Al Pasero Philly. We're here to talk to the Eagles because when it comes to intriguing teams for the 2022 NFL season, I don't think there's a team that's higher at the list than the Philadelphia Eagles. How are we doing today? I'm doing good, man. I appreciate you having me on here. You know, representing the beautiful city of Philadelphia and our birds. It's going to be an exciting season. There are some crazy expectations. Are they valid? I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it for sure, brother. We'll talk about it for sure, but it's good that I'm having you on because I love when this happens. Just as I quickly transition those wonderful StreamYard graphics, CJ Gardner Johnson, now a member of the Eagles. I feel like Howie's finally starting to realize not just like 2017, where obviously magic in a bottle happened, you guys won the Super Bowl, but putting all the perfect pieces in place to make this team a true success or have that potential, you know? Yeah, man. It, it was interesting because today, you know, I think throughout the whole camp, we all felt in Eagles Nation that the safety position was at the strong suit. And we were just kind of seeing, you know, all right, well, maybe Marcus Epps took another step in his game. Maybe Kayvon Wallace did it as well. We all know we have an Anthony Harris. But then come today, you get the cut of Anthony Harris. Um, there's rumors that Rudy Ford can be coming back to Philly. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, Chauncey could get, comes available, cuts traded here. New Orleans didn't want to pay him. And he comes here now. We was like, there was like a draft swap as well. You get another pick for the birds as two. And you got a starting safety to go alongside Marcus Epps. I'm still not completely comfortable with that position, but with Chauncey, I do feel like you get a little bit more than what Anthony Harris could offer you. This is a guy who can play some nickel, can play a little bit in the box. He's tenacious. He's got some aggressiveness. And above all else, my man can craft talk too. And I think in Philadelphia, he's going to be very much appreciated. That's the thing I was going to say, too, because we know from last year he really got under Tom Brady's skin. And the Eagles <laughs> and Philly just thrives off of that. They thrive off the, you know, those guys that aren't afraid to get dirty, not afraid to – not just in like on the football field, but like just when it comes to talking and just actions and stuff like that. Like, obviously, look, the Broad Street Bullies were a thing. Where we're not saying they're going to go out there and punching heads in every week, but it's in that sense <laughs> where if you can do enough shit talking just to get under someone's skin, I feel like that can win that fan base over because – Philly's up there when it comes to like the just passion. I feel like it's a people see it as aggression, but some people view it as passion. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of the times we do get a little bit misinterpreted here in Philadelphia. I mean, something people need to understand the Northeast portion region of the United States. So what I'm what am I referring to? I'm referring to the New England area like Boston. New yeah. York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, D.C. to an extent. <laughs> It's obviously, you know, you got your cold months, you got some disgruntled people, you know, and not everyone's always hunky dory. You know, it's your a lot of your blue collar towns, you know, as I like to say, your lunch pail, you know, people getting up early to work, you know, getting out late to work. So hard working mentality has been a thing. And in Philadelphia, one thing that people like to do is they like to escape and they escape through the sports. So sports are very important to us, and there's been this mantra of the whole four for four or now five for five as we include the MLS to this as well. And so what people don't understand is that what we demonstrate out on, as, on this, in the stands as fans, it's, it's tough love. It's that brotherly love you always hear about. We always be hard on you because we want the best from you. It's like, it's like being a parent with your kids. You're not going to you know, let your kids run all over you because he's going to do that a real you – know, you're going to add some discipline. You're going to be tough on him so he can be ready for the real world. And that's why people don't always understand Philadelphians because we always demonstrate that tough love, but it's always – it comes from the heart. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you can be hard on your players, but at the same time too, it's one of those things where, hey, we – we just want to see you do good better. Now, obviously, there's one player who took that exception a little bit further, but we're not going to get into that because that's obviously a different sport. But I do also appreciate you including it being five, not four, because there's a lot of people out there sure. who look at MLS as another league, but there's other players that are coming over. We'll, we'll we'll just leave it there. MLS is a sport that should be more recognized, but it'll be coming soon on Apple TV especially. Yes, sir. The biggest part of expectations this year, I think, falls mainly under – I could say Nick Sirianni, but I feel like that's taking the easy way out just because it's always, you know, oh, coach has to live up to the expectations. But I truly feel like Jalen Hurts is that mantra when it comes to expectations this year, not just in Philly, but in the NFL as a whole. Because I feel like a lot of people think, hey, he has to take that true, true leap to being a QB1. Yeah, no, listen, uh, well, let's not steer away from Nick Sirianni too far because there are expectations. There were expectations for him because when you think about the birds, who was the previous coach? Doug Peterson. And what did he do? He brought this city its only Super Bowl. So there was always going to be pressure on Nick Sirianni. I think the difference is, is that 
Nick kind of proved himself a little bit last year. You saw his coaching changes. He implemented more of a running game. The guys definitely responded. There was the media killing him. You know, there was the whole plant in the root type of uh, synonym or, or an analogy he was using, and everyone was kind of killing him for that. But I think a lot of people feel a little more comfortable with him. Hertz is a different story. The consensus is around this team is that this team is a team that can not only compete for winning the division, but obviously make a run in the playoffs. But a lot of people are putting it on all on the shoulders of Jalen Hurts. Can Jalen Hurts get the job done? Can he improve upon his game? He obviously did just enough for this team to make the playoffs. And obviously, you look at that a little bit with a little with just a little, a little blinded eyes because they had an easy schedule going down the line to make it to the playoffs. And so this year, the schedule is just a little bit, a little bit harder. And obviously, you hear all the preseason buzz. There's some expectation for this team. So how will Jalen be able to handle that? I think as a leader, his intangibles are clearly there. He knows how to rise to the occasion. It's more so the intangibles on the field, being able to read a defense quick enough and make the right reaction quick enough as well. Those are things we're hindering him. The accuracy part, I think it is livable. I think he'll be fine with that. But one thing you need to remember as well, for Jalen, not running the ball as your first first read should not be what he's looking for this is a passing league the eagles clearly want to pass the ball so that's what they're looking for here if he can be the gunslinger the 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 lead the the architect of all this so we'll see what how Jalen can perform here it's really going to be all on his shoulder so well most all on his shoulder i should say yeah exactly because yeah any quarterback because now we look everyone looks at that mobile running atmosphere of the nfl but at the same time too yeah you still have to be able to sling it 20 30 45 50 however many yards downfield you got to be able to do that in the nfl and i feel like a big part of that and i'll get into this in a bit is just the overall how the offensive line can perform because philly does have a very top tier offensive line on paper it's just more or less now can they stay on the field and stay healthy which we'll i want i want to get into in a little bit but when it comes to the eagles as a whole if the hype is there and they make the playoffs, say if they win the division 10 and seven season or 11 and six, let's just say, let's say there, but they get out in the wild card round again or get out in the divisional round. Is it viewed as a failure of a season? Or if you see the progressions there and know, Hey, we have something brewing that we can build off of 2022 to bring forward to 23. It's something that Eagles fans can look back on and say, Either, hey, it was a successful season, or no, this guy's a bum. Get him out of here. Get us a new quarterback. That's a really good question. I, I think as a team and as far as Jalen Hurts, the standards are a little bit different. And yeah. it obviously depends on who you ask. For me personally, Jalen, I need to see some clear improvements on his mechanics and just being able to read the field better. That's one thing. Like A lot of the skepticism as well has been the fact that he hasn't been really known as a clutch quarterback, a fourth quarter quarterback. I want to see him kind of perform in those type of instances. Can he win you the ball game in a last minute drive? And those are things that I obviously want to see as well. But for me, there needs to be a significant improvement as far as the mechanics go. Not much of a stack guy, but obviously he needs to be able to throw more than 16 touchdowns. Um, you know, nine receptions is great, but let's be a little realistic. And he obviously needs to throw more than 1800 yards as well. So those are all improvements that need to happen. As far as his team goes, I think that, Winning a playoff game has to be the expectation. I think that that's where we need to be. The whole NFC Championship, Super Bowl talk, I'm relaxing on that. I'm not ready to go there. But, you know, every era is a little bit different. Andy Reid, you know, in his second year, took the Eagles to three straight NFC Championship games. Uh, or four, I'm sorry, four straight NFC Championship games with the Super Bowl appearance. Doug Peterson in his second year won the Super Bowl. You can't always judge that. Things are different. So I think for this team, this iteration of the Birds, winning a playoff game, it has to be the expectation. Just one. Yeah, and I look at your schedule, too, and, like, week one, Detroit, probably a win. But then week two, at home, in that weird Monday nighter, like, we'll call it a doubleheader because one game starts at 7, one game starts at 8.30. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's a game where you see a lot of them this year already in, like, the first couple weeks where you're going to find out real quick who these teams are when they stack up against good competition. And even here, that there's a three-game run in October where it's, Cardinals, Cowboys, Steelers, with one of those being Sunday night football that I look at for, you know, that true, true test of what is this team made of? And then obviously there's that ending where you have the Giants, the Bears, and the Giants again, which look, when the Giants play the Eagles, I pick up a certain running back. He scores a touchdown or two, and we're all good. His name may be Boston. I don't know, but he's for some reason a giant killer. And 
I may have just given away a great fantasy waiver wire secret for non Eagles fans for those weeks it's, with one of them, obviously is week 18, but for week 14, uh, you may want to look at that. It's not even just the giants. He did really well against the jets in both the regular season and in the preseason game as well. Just likes playing against New York teams. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, like I said, I just look at that like mid season stretch right there where it's those like three teams, the Cardinals, yeah. Cowboys, Steelers, because well, for one interstate rival, is it a rivalry with the Steelers, or is it just like one of those like um, you know bragging rights games? With I, I know there's a bigger rivalry yeah. with hockey with those two. Oh yeah, for sure. But I, the problem is, is that Flyers and Penguins play in the Metro, yeah. whereas the Eagles are in the NDV, Steelers in the AFC. So it's really tough. It's very much similar to like the Giants and the Jets. Like there's always that bragging rights because it's your you know in that case it's the, it's the stadium you're fighting yeah. for. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's state bragging rights. And Pennsylvania is a very proud football state. So there's always going to be that East versus West mentality between both those teams. But it should obviously be fun. There's going to be some crap talk. And I think during 2020, we actually played in Heinz Field, which is now, I don't even know the name of it. But um, that, well, that, that's Heinz Field. <laughs> yes, well, Heinz Field. It'll, not, it'll never not be Heinz Field. But yeah. that's a good point. It's going to be a, a little bit of a tough stretch there. I mean, the Eagles have some some good playoff opponents there. I I talked about it earlier in the year. I think the Vikings are going to be a a surprise team, but that could be in the beginning of the year when it comes to those type of teams that are having you coach, they could start off slow. I could see the Vikings kind of, you know, ending it uh, in a good note, but yeah. How how are they going to be able to contain a guy like um, uh, Kyler Murray? And, you know, when it comes to the Cowboys, obviously divisional game, it's, it's always, it's always going to be a tough fall game. And then, of course, the Steelers. I don't really know what to, to expect too much from the Steelers, but obviously you like that defensive matchup. It's always, you know, Steelers are always going to have a tough nose defense, and you want to see how a guy like Jalen Hurts is able to to play uh, to play against that. And then it's always great to uh, cap that um, with the Texans the next week on a Thursday night game. So I know it's just that quick little – this is just that quick little trip to Houston uh, where I, I expect maybe there will be Eagles fans making the trip. There's um, – I think there's one guy on TikTok. For some reason, you feel I gotta say that Philly Philly sports has a really pr- dominant presence on TikTok. They have a really dominant presence, and I don't know his first name, but there's the one guy who I always just see like fully Philly decked. sports guy. Yeah, like every sport, just like face yeah, paint, hair dye. I'm like, great. Okay, dude. There's, there's dedication, and then then there's that. Yeah, he's uh, he's freaking phenomenal. We did a, a show for like eight months essentially um, from. 2020 fall 2020 up until the end of 2021 and he's dude he's really dedicated the man does not stop he travels with what all these philly sports teams predominantly the eagles of course but um yeah he's 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 fun he's he kind of exemplifies the passion of philly sports fan yeah exactly exactly because like that's a dream i feel like because i feel like there are fans out there who that's their vacations every year they travel from city to city watching their nfl team personally yeah (laughs) I'd love to do it too. It's just a little tougher for me with, uh, it's just, it's just tougher. That's all. But yeah. if, if you're dedicated to it, I just, I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying all the power to you. Cause that's, that's something that, how about this? It's like internal jealousy. How about that? Yes. It's internal jealousy more than anything. Yes. Just, game, I do just one, like I, I'm trying to do for the other leagues as well. That way you can knock out more cities in America, but, uh, I will be at the Arizona game. So any birds fans, I will see you down there for week four against Arizona. So mm-hmm. excited for that one. So just remember, folks, hit uh, El Pasero out if you're going for there. The w- most recent ones I've done was just Toronto, Montreal. I've done it for both hockey and MLS, which they treated it like – I don't know how it is with the away fans in Philly, but I know in Toronto, like, there's a separate sections. There's, like – like, it is it has a bit of the hostile environment when you're an away MLS fan at a different stadium. But – Obviously, with the Eagles, look, we've talked about the additions. James Bradbury, except, well, actually, we didn't even talk about him, but like that's another addition. Gardner Johnson, but I think we can't go without Philly. We can't go without talking about Philly for the folks watching on YouTube right now about AJ Brown, the draft night surprise. Because when you look at it, it was like, hey, do we want a receiver like a Traylon Burks, or do we want to go out there? Hey, we'll, we can give this guy money, sure, and an already established, probably top ten NFL receiver, sure, why not? So. It's just another key piece when you have Brown and Smith. That's another piece that doesn't even get talked about. I feel like Devonta Smith has really gone like unnoticed outside of Philly where everyone's just like, hey, they got A.J. Brown at the same time too. You have a stud wide receiver out of Alabama as well. I'm going to say this. Besides A.J. Brown, which I don't think we need to debate how good he is. Yeah. 
this is the best wide receiving group in my lifetime. I think the best was like the late 2010s. We had or early 2010s as well. You had Deshaun Jackson, Jeremy Macklin, and and um and Jason Avant, all like really serviceable. Um, they they obviously all play their part, but in this Eagles locker or this Eagles wide receiving room, you have AJ Brown, who can be an arguable, arguably top five, top ten wide receiver. Devontae Smith is literally on his way. He broke the receiving yards record. As a rookie, he beat Deshaun Jackson. It was like, oh, by a couple yards. And people are continue to sleep on Quez Watkins. The dude's got so much speed, needs to sharp his hands, I feel like. Um, but despite, despite, uh, despite that, he's been going up against some nickel cornerbacks. He's going to go up against some easier opponents as well. So I, I look at this wide receiver room. It's the best that we've ever had, and that lends to why there's extra pressure on Jalen Hurts because we've never had this. Not even Carson Wentz, not even Donovan freaking McNabb has had this. And then you also have Zach Pasco, which I'm, I I actually thoroughly do like. Um, he's familiar with Nick Sirianni as well, can block a little bit, he's got some strong hands. Um, so this is, to me, the best wide receiving room that we've ever had. And having A.J. Brown at that anchor, I mean, he's, he's a special player. Um, Devontae's going to be able to... It's funny because I feel like both of them can do similar things, but A.J. Brown, we all know his dominance, and that's catching those short yard uh, passes and getting those 20 extra yards, and that's going to be big. Where And Devontae, can, he is not much of a – he's not as big of a yak guy as A.J. Brown, but they can do a little bit of everything. They have the short, intermediate, and long long uh, route game, and they both have strong hands. So Jalen Hurts is going to have a tough job. I think the one question for me that I'm looking for is how is that chemistry going to go? Because you're going to have those games where A.J. Brown's dominating or Devontae Smith's dominating. Are they both going to be okay with that? I would assume yes, but I want to watch that. Quick side note, I don't know how much of a gambling man you are because I know it's popular, but I, it's still not a thing for everyone, even though I am. That's kind of like what I'm more or less doing on TikTok is just more sports gambling. But week 18, who put money on Quez Watkins touchdown? That would be me, and I got some money from it. So There you go, sure man. That. Yeah. So that's where when you say that name, I think right away – Money, but even too, you're right. Like when I think of the early 2000s Eagles, I think of Brian Westbrook immediately. I don't like the receiving room. Like at the top of my head, I can except for probably Terrell Owens. You don't like Charles Johnson or James Thrash, Todd Pinkston, Greg Lewis. The names just didn't come to me at the top of my head, just because like when I, you think of those Eagles, like those Eagles teams, and for me, it was the three main guys, which was McNabb, Westbrook, and Brian Dawkins. Every time you see those, you see certain safety or defensive highlights, it's always just how much of a dog Brian Dawkins was like we've we've had like you know I'll throw Carson Wentz in this as well because Carson Wentz early part of his career was really damn good and people forget his rookie year my dude was throwing to guys like Doriel Green Beckham Nelson Aguilar when he was not the Nelson Aguilar of 2017 and like it's crazy like we literally give these young quarterbacks with so much promise these wide receivers who are just god awful then you got Jalen Hurts second round pick not much expectations. And then he gets A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith with Quez Watkins. And, oh, by the way, you also have Dallas Goddard who's going to also be a top five tight end, too. So it's funny how that works. Yeah, exactly. And then even to Miles Sanders can still contribute as a running back. Yes, sir. Um, the offensive line, like I said earlier, does intrigue me, which I'm, it's the point I'm going to get to now, which is I think this team, health is a huge thing. I feel like every year it's someone on the Eagles gets hurt. Like I feel like it was Brandon Brooks one year. One year was Fletcher Cox. Uh, Brandon Graham. It's just been like a constant. These guys got to stay healthy. I think that's a big key for the Eagles' success this year. Is just you got to limit guys on the IR. Obviously, people get hurt in football, but it's always it's not just like an injury or like a few week thing. It's always yeah. like you know an Achilles, an ACL, uh, you name it. Like just a devastating season-ending injury when you're like, hey, this guy's finally showing promise. Oh, boom! There goes his there goes his knee. There goes his ankle. I'll say that, I mean, like, I think things have kind of changed in Seriani's gotten here, and people kill the mentality of how coaches kind of approach training camp and preseason. It's not as hard as it used to be. Obviously, two days are essentially gone. Um, you got guys more in their shells and shorts instead of the full pads, and people Guardian freak out caps. about it. It's, yeah, it's like, where's the old school football? Back in my day, we were doing Oklahoma's until someone died, and it's like, that's not how it should be. We're yeah. trying to play, you know, January and February football. And doing that in August is really not conducive for anything. So I really do appreciate that. 
Last year, we were one of the healthiest. It was one of the healthiest team I've ever seen in my lifetime as an Eagles fan. And I think a lot of it had to do with, obviously, the advances in sports science, yes, but understanding that rest is so important. And for everyone out there, not just athletes, please get your rest. Seven, eight hours. I was someone who was like, sleep, I'll sleep when I die. But it goes a long way, and it does for these players too. Um, but I'll say this as well. If someone does happen to go down, Howie has built this team enough that if someone does go down, there is someone right behind them. You know, it's funny. We were all in Philadelphia killing the Cam's Jurgens pick in the second round because you had Nicobe Dean on the board. You need a linebacker. You need a safety. Howie, what are you doing? But there is a brilliance to Howie's madness. And that you got Cam Jurgens. Jason Kelsey went down week one of training camp. Cam Jurgens has got some valuable time with the first teamers. And his, his dude, his stunness is shining. That dude is, there's people already saying that he's going to be better than Jason Kelsey when it comes to it. Dude's big, he's athletic. But even if, if Landon Dickerson goes down, um, you could put Sue Opeta. If, if, if um, Sale Malu goes down, you put Driscoll in. You put, uh, if, if um, Mylotta goes down, you put in Dillard. And that is the beauty of what Howie Roseman has been able to build. And that's everywhere throughout the field. Foster Cox goes down. You got Milton Williams, so on and so forth. So the depth is really important, man. And the Eagles still got Nicobe Dean at the end of the day, too. So it was just even better. <laughs> every, every year there's a guy that falls. Every year, no matter the sport, there's always that one guy that drops. But that's the best thing with football where you need. It's that next man up mentality. But I love the point you're making where it's like, oh, back in my day, we did like the Oklahoma drills all night long until someone died. Yeah, that's Urban Meyer literally got fined money for that, doing that last year. Because guess what? You're not supposed to have NFL players doing the Oklahoma drill. That's high school stuff. That's yeah. very dangerous. That's why the like that's why I had to mention the Guardian caps because I feel like some people view that as oh, what are they doing? But in reality, you're trying to make sure these players not only play safer, but don't risk their long term health and future because we all know what kind of boogeyman the CTE stuff yeah. has been lingering for this league for years because it's not just like oh certain team problems. Which by the way, the way you said the Oklahoma drill thing. Maybe think of like half of the guys who are trying out for the Eagles in the in that Mark Wahlberg yeah. Invincible movie, just like waiting in line and stuff. Where it's like, yeah, I haven't played. I played in high school and all this stuff, and like they're severely out of shape. I'm just like, <laughs> that's the kind of Eagles fan you took me to right there. Or football fan in general, where it's just like, oh yeah, if I'm still out there, we doing this. It's like, well, you're not, sir. What are you doing here? What do you mean? What am I doing here? I'm trying out for the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> uh, and then just start singing "Fly Eagles, Fly" and all that stuff too. It's just That's like, really, uh, baby. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's passion, but I love it when you said "blue collar" the best because it just seems like yeah. there. I know Pittsburgh too, and ex, uh, Pittsburgh too. It's just Buffalo. There's all these towns that when the team wins and when the city wins, it's so it's great man. for the city. Look, I'll admit losing Super Bowl Fifty Two sucked, but you know what? The amount of Eagles fans I know and seeing them happy, I was like, you know what? I can put this one aside and be happy for you because I know how long you guys have waited for this and how special that. Oh, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's just, I also feel like, too, there's Eagles fans everywhere. It's just one of those teams where, like I was saying earlier, how now there is. Yeah. It's a little bit easier to be a fan of it throughout the last two, three decades. But I mean, I look back at like, and so I'm a first generation American. So, you know, I don't have a dad or a grandpa that's telling me stories about the birds. I had friends and I would live vicariously through their dads. And while they weren't much of football fans, I would listen to their stories and just hearing the stories of the Brayman days and even like Jaws and with Dick Vermeil, even back into the, the, the concrete Chucky day or Charlie days. And it's, it's changed a lot. Um, this is a respected organization and, People can clown us all we want, all they want, just one Super Bowl. But, you know, it's about what have you done for me now? And what the Eagles have done to the league, obviously, besides the money, they're a very profitable team. Their values gone skyrocketed since Jeffrey Laurie has bought the, the team. But it's been a constant, like, degree of success. Like, yep. they have been in the playoffs more than they haven't, essentially. And, you know, obviously, the Super Bowl win is big. The playoff wins are huge as well. And they are a respected franchise. You could say what you want, but you know, not a lot of people do what the Eagles have done over the last 20 years. And for Eagles fans, be, be thankful. You know, we don't always have that here in Philadelphia. I mean, just look at the Flyers. All right. So appreciate it. I, I, I could go on a Chuck Fletcher rant because I do some hockey writing on the side as well, <laughs> but I'm not I'm not going to. I'm not I'm not going you don't need to. to remind us, man. We no. we've been living through this, dude. No, oh I know, I know, I know. 
Uh, but the one thing, when you're saying all that stuff, it just seems Jeffrey Lurie and Robert Kraft, it's like similar effects on their teams where it's ever since they've come in, look, there's been, obviously New England's had more success, but that, I'm not here to brag about that or argue that. I'm just saying there's been success. The team's profitability has skyrocketed. The team's fan base outside of the city has skyrocketed. Because if you read about the Patriots, like the 60s, the 70s, and even the 80s up until the 90s, because Kraft bought the team in 94, it's not pretty. It's not. They were one of the worst franchises in the NFL for a very long time. Like, hell, we'll see if Buffalo can do it, but it's the same thing, too, where winning cures all. Simple as that, man. Simple as that. Uh, but with the NFC East quickly, when you have the other teams, I want to ask you more or less, because Dallas always look. We're I'm not <laughs> bullish on them. It's just the world is happier when the Cowboy fans are at their worst. Yes. It's just the – world is a great place yes but i want to ask you right now between dc and the giants do you see any hope of or glimmers there of hope for the, either the franchise like you put put the put the rivalry bias aside like if you're looking at it yeah, from no, a football no, 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 point of, of course, view of course do you see any glimmers of hope for either team dallas's depth concerns me um Dak is getting a little bit older as well. I, I wouldn't be banking on Zeke either. And, you know, they lost some serious weapons. And I, I think that, and they obviously just lost Tyron Smith as well. I mean, don't don't, don't downgrade that as well. Um, So I think that their depth is one thing. I Because I, obviously, like, they have some guys. They have a staple. They have a core that is pretty good. And I think that they could still be good enough for second place. They It might be like a race with the Birds and the Cowboys for most of the season. But I think the Eagles just have more than the boys to get the job done as far as winning division. I'll say this. The commanders, they they really, listen, no rivalry side. They really do not concern me. Um, I don't like the recipe with what they have. Um, I'm not really buying Carson Wentz getting the job done at the end of the year. I think he'll have some big games. And I think he might, I'll, I'll say this, he'll have a big game against the Birds, either in D.C. or in Philly. I could definitely predict that. The Giants, to me, are the biggest wild card now. I know that Daniel Jones hasn't had a, a really good training camp preseason, but I really do think highly of Brian Dable. And I know you were, you know, you were close to Buffalo, so you kind of saw what he was doing uh, up there. But I really watched it, and he was actually someone I wanted in 2021 when we fired Doug Peterson. He actually said no to the Birds, which you know, I, I think you're going to pay for that this year. But, um, <laughs> but I, I really do like what he's doing. I like the draft that they did. Obviously, it's it, Thibodeau. It's kind of tough with that injury. Um, but if anything, out of any of those teams, I think the Giants could be the one that could, could surprise us potentially. But um, it's tough, man. It's tough. Howie has really done a good job of building together an all-around good roster. And this is a team that, let's not forget, made the playoffs last year as a wild card, as a nine-win team. And they only got better. And you have pieces that were young last year, taking another step this year. Um, so it's it's going to be tough for those other three teams. And I, and it, it really it's true what they say. The Eagles are, at the moment, the class of the division. I completely agree with you. I think you could see a world where you and Dallas are kind of playing and then in December, Philly pulls away. So say it's like an 11-6 season for the Eagles and like the Cowboys finish like 10-7 and seven or 9-8, and eight, somewhere in there. Because always, look, they always have embarrassing losses. They always find a way to shoot themselves in the foot. It's um, Dallas. And also, too, seeing Stephen A. Smith just smile and mock them, too. So, I know he's, he's got his, – sometimes his opinions are a little iffy, but I think we can all agree whenever we watch him clown the Cowboys, it's it's great. Commanders, I agree with you. They, they aren't a concern, but I think they can do just enough to keep that core in place and maybe start building where you look two years down the road. Maybe with Sam Howell, maybe you keep Carson Wentz around, who knows. The Giants, it's a team I've been very vocal against. I like the surroundings. It's the quarterback. I just can't. I just don't see a world where Daniel Jones all of a sudden takes this crazy Josh Allen-esque leap, which I think a lot of Giants fans think he's capable of. I think we would have seen it by now because I feel like they always try to blame, you know, oh, but Pat Shermer and then Joe Judge, but then Jason Garrett. Like, it's all this, this, and this. While Jason Garrett, yeah, sure, he had a bad tenure as Giants OC, moderately successful where he was constantly winning or doing okay with the Cowboys as head coach for even all the time. I mean, he should have been fired, but a fun fact I want to tell you quickly about why I think the Eagles are going to win the division because every year that Taylor Swift releases an album, the Cowboys have a down year and she's coming out with a new album in November. So just take that for my, take that for what it is. 
as a uh, part-time Swifty, I, I I'm happy to hear this, and uh, I'll take a, I'll take a couple more albums for the next decade or two. So get it going, Taylor. We need you. My girl needs you. Griff needs you. I need you. Philadelphia needs you. All right. <laughs> But I feel like at the end of the day, too, with Eagles fans, I feel like you got everyone. It's just like, yeah, the Giants are the Giants, and it's just a rivalry. But I feel like everyone just, like, hates the Cowboys more than anything. It's just – even though it's weird how it's yeah. all this East Coast and then Dallas for some reasons in the East as well, which I feel like they should – I think we all equally hate – I think the Cowboys are the most hated team in this division. But, I mean, we all have our disdain. And then you got, like, the little brother, D.C., <laughs> always say that, man, because they've just been so irrelevant for since Snyder has been there. So it's kind of just like, ah, oh, it's D.C. Yeah, and then it, yeah, and then the Giants are kind of like that one friend that like sometimes they can be cool, but then sometimes they'll say something like either incredibly awkward or like incredibly. They are very annoying. I'll say that they are very very annoying. And I think it's too because I'm not sure how you if you know how New Jersey works, but I actually live in New Jersey. I live like I live literally right right outside of Philadelphia, but it's in New Jersey. I count New South Jersey, Jersey as Philly. <laughs> yes. It is not a real state. We're literally divided by two major cities in the Northeast. So we have to deal with Giants fans all the time here because, you know, sometimes they come move down here. We move up there. So you always get Giants and Eagles fans just getting going back and forth with it. Um, it's same thing with the Phillies and Mets. But, uh, yeah, I, it, they can be they can be very, very annoying. The Cowboys thing is annoying because it's like, why are you a Cowboys fan? And like, I literally grew up down the street from you. We literally were over watching the birds as a kid. Why are you a Cowboys fan? And that's just like the weird part about it. Yeah. And I feel like, cause I feel like Cowboys fans are like how we, well, it's obviously different from Yankees fans, it's, but it's just both are incredibly annoying to me. And I don't even mind the team. It's just the fans are the ones that for me truly kill the experience, even though Yankees are an individual rival for myself. I bet you I could become really good friends with a Cowboys fan that's actually from Dallas. I feel like it's all the ones from like outside of where the team is is that are the more annoying ones. Especially that type of fan base, man. Mm. Special, indeed. But I, yeah, I completely agree with you when you say the whole thing about Jersey because I know if it's like North Jersey, that's more yeah. New York-based yeah. sports. And then South is more Philadelphia. It's kind of like how Connecticut's split up where you have the more part of Connecticut that's Boston, but then you have parts of Connecticut that are for New York. I will say this. I know this is a football show, but yeah. if a New South Jersey wants to be a Devils fan, that is okay. That's not a violation. Just want to put that out there. Uh, I mean, no one really. Do we? It's... I think people want to be Devils fans now, especially in South Jersey. But I listen. You know, we're, we're orange and black through and through here. We'll, we'll we'll go through the bumps and bruises. You only have to go through those because you know at the end of the day it's it can get better. That's the reason for going through it. I'm hoping. You're not an Arizona Coyotes fan. You're okay. Or an Atlanta Thrashers fan, right? I mean, it's... <laughs> I mean Winnipeg's okay. Winnipeg's fine. You're not playing in a 5,000-seat arena on a college campus. Oh, man, dude. That's rough. It, 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 it's, it's rough. It's rough. It's almost as bad as the Chargers playing in MLS Stadium, but hey, you know. <laughs> You know what? It, it, first, that, that one was just weird. That's that was just the the Spanos family. Basically, the ice. Before we end, I'm just gonna say that with the Chargers, they had the opportunity to stay in San Diego, but the city basically wouldn't give them the money, and then ownership was too cheap to build a new stadium. And then Kroenke comes along and says, "Hey, we're building a mega stadium outside of LA. Want to come be a co-tenant?" And then they had the yeah, sure, play in the LA Galaxy Stadium for a few seasons, but then now they have SoFi, but. And also, we talked about this off air, but I said with Toronto, it's like a similar thing with the Rams, where you'd have like bandwagon Rams fans, but then like the stadium no. in Toronto would be like not like say if it was a Toronto NFL team versus New England, it'd be ninety percent Patriots fans. I'm not even I'm not even kidding when I say that. Or even if the birds come up here, birds would dominate. You'd be it'd be a Kelly Green, which best throwback non New England jersey. I'll say this right now are the Kelly Green Eagles jerseys in my okay. Opinion. Respect, respect. Bills are coming back next year. I'm excited for that. Hopefully, man. Give me the give me those helmets, dude. Give me give me give me that look. But anyway, before we wrap up, I'm gonna give. I know you have a big social media following: TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. Let the people know who may not know exactly who you are, where they can find you, and check out your content. Yeah, man. So first off, thank you so ha so much for having me on, man. Um, you know, if you are interested in Philly sports, you know, we always listen. We're all about the community, sports community in general. Uh, we like to, you know, we like to bust chops over there. It's Philadelphia. It's what we do down there. 
Uh, but yeah, so pretty much I cover anything that's Philadelphia sports, Eagles, Sixers, Phillies, Flyers, and yes, the Philadelphia Union as well. Um, so we do, we, after every game, we do live recaps on YouTube. So you make sure you guys are subscribed there. We always post content on TikTok too. We always interact on Twitter as well. If you want to get into my personal life, you can find me on Instagram as well. Um, everything is under my link trees. Everything pretty much under El Parcero Philly. Uh, so definitely follow, subscribe, love to interact with you, talk football whenever we can. And uh, make sure you guys, more importantly, follow, uh, subscribe and follow DeGriff. Uh, he's doing a great job. Uh, I'm not much of a gambler, so I like to look at Griff for some gambling advice. Maybe I can tell a buddy like, hey, maybe take the under for the Sabres versus Leafs game. I don't know. Whatever he's telling me to do, I'm telling you to do. So make sure you guys subscribe to my man here. Oh, I appreciate the plug. Thank you very much. Um, one thing I want to ask you, too, just quickly. This is a Philadelphia question in general. Best cheesesteak in the city. Because I'll, I'll tell you when I was there what I had, but I want to get your opinion. And also, are Pat and Gino's good, or are they just more of the tourist spots? I'll be honest with you. Yeah. And me and my girlfriend finally solidified this. If you really want a good cheesesteak, go to your nearest pizza shop. I'm not even kidding. Especially here. I, I, I just moved to I moved back to South Jersey like I literally like a month ago. Found a new pizza spot that I absolutely loved. I was like, babe, want a cheesesteak. Let's get a cheesesteak. I got a cheesesteak there. I'm telling you, it was phenomenal. It was absolutely great. Flavor, the meat was chopped fine, perfect amount of cheese, bread was perfect. You gotta have all that combination. Um, if you're looking for a staple cheesesteak spot, Phillips is really solid. Uh it's all it's a cash only joint. That's all the way down in Maniunk. Um, Jim's, may, hopefully they come back soon. They actually just went through a fire. So we're hoping that they're okay. Um, the thought is that they're going to come back, but obviously it's going to take some time. In the meantime, one more spot, uh, Ro uh, John's Roast Pork. They do have pork sandwiches, but they also do have cheesesteaks that are pretty damn good. Jim's and, and, and or, I'm sorry, Pat's and Gino's. They are okay. I understand people slander them. They're not the best. I wouldn't recommend that to you, but I understand why it's very touristy these days. Pats to me are a little bit better. I eat those spots at three in the morning after having a couple of adult beverages and I'm hungry and I want a cheesesteak. Give me some fries as well. Those are definitely some good spots, but they're definitely not the best, but you know, they're, they're also not terrible either. When I was there, I went to Tony Luke's. I enjoyed it. Good spot as well. It was good, but I had, and I feel like some people say you should go with the Wiz. I went with Provolone. I liked it better personally. I just let's let's put it this way: if there's no Wiz option, I'm doing Provolone. I'm not a big American cheese guy, so I would do the Provolone. And they will slander it here in Philly, but it it is good cheese. It's good cheese. I feel like I was gonna call this like podcast like the Birds or something like that, but I might just call it like cheesesteak or something like that, just because like it's it's a staple. Like you're you're from the area. I had to ask you just to get like the true Philly insight. Yeah, on man. what a good cheesesteak or where the best cheesesteak is. But if I'm ever in Philly again, I'll have to probably check out one of these pizza uh, pizza shops or one of the locations that you That's just mentioned. Good, me. man. I don't know what it is. I think they just put extra love in it, um, but they are really good. I mean, most pizza shops will sell you a good cheesesteak at a decent price and a decent size too, man. Get your bang for your buck. That's what I'm all about here. We, we love to hear it. We love to hear it. Well, anyway, El Pasero, appreciate you going on again. I don't want to take up too much of your time. But, folks, thank you very much for listening to another episode of YWC Football Talk, episode 177. When you see me next week, we're talking week one, and I cannot wait. Yeah. Have a good one, everybody.